broadcasting from 88.3 FM WXUT studio. This is your Saturday morning weekly news update. It is 7.45 in the morning and today is October 2nd. It is expected to be a sunny day outside with a high of 79 and a low of 64 degrees. These stories were researched and reported by student journalists at UT 10 News. Let's begin. The Texas Heartbeat Act has raised concerns across the nation. Today, we have Daisy Caruso with us to have a conversation about how the abortion laws in Texas could affect us here in Ohio. Thank you for joining us, Daisy. How have you been? I've been pretty good. Can't complain too much. <laughs> I, I get it. So, Daisy, tell us, a little, tell us a little bit about the Texas abortion law. All right, so Texas abortion law um, is currently the strictest abortion law in the country. Um, essentially, it um, outlaws abortions that are performed like at around like six weeks when the fetal pulse is detected. Um, it does have some medical exceptions if the case is deemed severe enough, but it doesn't have any exceptions for like rape or incest or things like that. Could you please tell us about some of the facts that you found when you were pursuing the story? I found that um, it would make the majority of abortions that occur in Texas um, illegal because like the majority is are performed after six weeks. Um, the law is going to be enforced like by private citizens, meaning like anyone can really sue an abortion care provider even if they have no um, real connection to like the case or the person getting the abortion, the provider. Was there anything surprising oh. uh, while you were doing your research? In the past, like pretty much as far as like I know, Texas is the only one that has this type of reporting system where it's putting it on the private citizen to sue and things like that and taking it into um, civil court. But officially, it says that it's mostly, um, it's mostly like for like people that are performing the abortion. What specific uh, or what kind of questions and discussions is this Texas law drawing in terms of this overall topic? The main questions that arise is, will this affect me? Will this set a precedent um, for how laws are made in the future? Will it set a precedent for more abortion laws since they see like, oh, well, I see Texas did that. Will th that mean my legislatures will try to do this if they think that they can like successfully get it through? Um, because like I said, this is the strictest law in the country, abortion law in the country that has passed. Those states are going to be like, wait a minute, is this going to start a trend of something? Like, how will this affect me? What could be the possible concerns regarding this issue in Ohio? Ohio is also one of the states that has attempted to pass a six-week bill. Again, not like Texas is because of the weird enforcement thing. But Ohio has been one of those states. And currently we have um, a Republican governor. Um, we have a lot of conservatives that are pro-life in office that well, would potentially be interested in more restrictive um, policies and maybe would look to like, oh, I see what Texas did, could we do something over here sort of thing. Because um, even right now with the trigger bill in Ohio um, that they're discussing and trying to figure out, I think that's what was worrying other people because there's already like, oh wow, there's a lot of stuff already going on here, are they going to try to do something like this as well? I see. That was very informational. Thank you for joining us today, Daisy. Yeah, no problem. Talking about government authorities, UT10's Lauren Height tells us to register for the upcoming Ohio elections. The registration deadline in Ohio is October 4th and early voting will begin the very next day. The election takes place on November 2nd and you will need a valid driver's license or ID to register. You can register online or in person at your local Board of Elections building and in other places across the area. To learn more on how to get registered and see a list of registration locations, visit ut10news.com. Levis Commons creates buzz by investing millions of dollars in building constructions and creating job opportunities. One of the top real estate agents in Ohio, Rick Prokup, believes that they have a bright future ahead and new additions will satisfy the Toledo community as a whole. Levis Commons is actually extremely successful. I know people see some empty storefronts um, 
but uh, a lot of those, the stores that went out were simply uh, COVID related. We think this is the next evolution of it. it it's more of what people are looking for today. Um, so with, just with Danbury, there's roughly, uh, you know, 60 to 70 jobs. And um, the whole building probably has about 80 to 90 jobs attached to it. We've also leased another space to uh, Tan Lines. There's some new restaurants and things like that going in. So um, there's new apartments. They all feed off of each other, right? So this strategy increases their hopes of gaining their momentum back. Construction has already gotten underway, and Love is Common's plans to be rebranded by February next year. Excitement will brew as Heavy Beer Company and Black Kite Coffee team up with Toledo Metro Parks. UD10's Lauren Height takes a deeper look. The Toledo Metro Parks are a staple in the community. Oak Openings is the first Metro Park in Toledo, offering a coffee shop house and a brewery location. Scott Carpenter has been working for the Toledo Metro Parks for over 20 years and believes this is a great new development. We have the Treehouse Village there, which is like a hotel operation in a, in a sense. This provides food and beverage um, for the folks staying there. Heavy Beer Company and Black Kite Coffee are teaming up with the Metro Parks at the Beach Ridge area of Oak Openings. The building they will be operating in is called the Wheelhouse, and they will base their attention on the trail riders and hikers treehouse guests, and those who want to get into nature while also enjoying snacks, coffee, and beer. And can't wait to see what the folks from Heavy do to the interior uh, to bring that all together. This is a year-round project they can't wait to expand on. Heavy Beer Company has expanded from Toledo to Cleveland and southern Michigan, and the company hopes to be in Cincinnati and Chicago in the near future. Heavy Beer Company and Black Kite Coffee have seamlessly transitioned into working with the Metro Parks because they have previously worked together by creating a custom craft beer for the Metro Parks where some of the proceeds go towards its upkeep. And, uh, and so that was kind of a natural fit for us, and we had this great building, so it kind of all came together. The spokesperson says the bulk of the interior construction will be done next month. They're hoping to be open for no business in November. They say that love is a four-legged word. Momentum has been retained at Toledo Animal Rescue, as this year, pet adoption rates have increased. UT10's Tiara Medley tells us about the impact it has created. At the beginning of 2020, COVID hit shelters hard. Since then, they've regained some normalcy, but you'd be surprised at exactly how well they've bounced back. The Toledo Animal Shelter has been running strong for 94 years, but at the beginning of 2020, business stopped. And when they reopened, some things needed to be changed. Business was now to be done by appointment only, and masks are required at all times. Steve Kiesling, the director of the Toledo Animal Rescue, was just starting out at the shelter when the pandemic started. The organization basically shut its doors um, to intakes and adoptions in March because everything was so uncertain. Uh, we kind of kept with that in April. With the shutdown came the turning away of animals. And even when they reopened, adoption rates just weren't the same. So April last year, we did two animals. Um, we adopted out two animals. Then something strange happened. Adoptions spiked. 2019 didn't bring in as many adoptions as 2020. And 2021 has surpassed both years. Another shelter in the area has experienced the same thing. Sarah Baker is the shelter manager at Paws and Whiskers and noticed the rise in adoptions too. Our adoption rates are actually better than they used to be. There's however a potential problem that could impact the growing of those numbers and that's the recent rise in COVID cases. Don't see us closing again. Yes, we would go back to a very um, strict uh, appointment only, only one person, uh, wait in your car until you can come in, that kind of thing. To adopt a pet? Visit ToledoAnimalRescue.org or call 419-382-1130. And moving on to sports, UT10's Caleb Gill gives us an update on Rocket Athletics. This past weekend, two Rocket sports teams opened up MAC play. The women's soccer team has a few MAC games under their belt now, but first, the football team went into Muncie, Indiana, Muncie, Indiana with vengeance on their mind. The beginning of the game appeared to have the makings of a potential shootout with the Ball State Cardinals marching down the field on their opening drive to get a field goal. And the Rockets quickly answering with quarterback Carter Bradley hitting wide receiver Devin Maddox on a 69-yard touchdown. After struggling to get the ground game going a week prior, the Rockets seemed to have no issues running the ball at Ball State. The Rockets rushed for 272 yards with quarterback Daquan Finn leading the way with 106 yards rushing. 70 of those yards 
coming on Finn's touchdown run. Brian Kobach added to the Rockets' efforts on the ground with 84 yards rushing along with Jaquiz Stewart, who rushed for 58 yards. The Rockets' defense stepped up again for another week, now having back-to-back -back weeks without allowing an offensive touchdown. Four sacks from the defensive line helped to stop the Cardinals from getting anything going on offense. The Rockets would end up getting their revenge on the Cardinals after losing to them the last two seasons with a final score of 22-12. to It was a beautiful day for some soccer at Paul Hotmer Field, and the women's soccer team did not disappoint. After winning their first MAC game last Thursday against Northern Illinois, the Rockets came into Sunday's game hoping to start MAC play with two wins. In doing so, this required a strong performance from Emma Batorwick, who did not allow a single one of Western's shots on the goal. This is now Batorwick's sixth shutout of the season. Sophomores Ellie Poole and Grace Tursky each scored a goal for the Rockets, with Tursky getting one in the 37th minute and Poole getting one almost immediately after halftime in the 46th minute. The Rockets would go on to beat the Broncos 2-0. Freshman McKenna Schultz also played a major role in the Rockets getting two shutouts this weekend, which allowed her to be named MAC Defensive Player of the Week. And that's it for this week, and thank you for joining us today. For more news, make sure to tune in every Saturday at 7.45 a.m. And you can catch UT10 News live every Thursday at noon, or watch it on WGTE Public Media Fridays at 6.30 p.m. For 88.3 FM WXUT, I'm Deepa Bushball. Have a great day.